But there was one girl, my best friend, who happened to be there, who survived and came back and told us what their last minutes were like. Everybody was so badly burned, and the math teacher was there supervising the girls. And uh, they couldn't walk. The math teacher invited the girls to surround her. So from my school, all the girls came in circle. And last thing they wanted to do was to sing the hymn together. And their favorite, favorite word, What is English translation for that? Nearer to thee, my Lord. My name is Bonnie Doherty, and I'm the Associate Director of Armed Conflict and Civilian Protection uh, at the Human Rights Clinic here at Harvard Law School. Uh, it's an important and timely event, given the tensions among nuclear powers that are dominating the news today. It is critical to understand the human consequences uh, of nuclear weapons and the power of a humanitarian response. Before I hand, hand the floor over, uh, I'm going to offer some context for the presentation. As you all know, the dropping of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, revolutionized modern warfare and caused horrific immediate and long-term effects. The bombs and their side effects killed more than 200,000 people in the first five months alone, and thousands more died in the years that followed. These, detail, these are the details of the events that are a story for Setsuko to tell. I instead want to highlight three historical periods uh, that are essential to understanding this issue from a humanitarian perspective. The post-World War II era of nuclear testing and early disarmament efforts, the emergence of a humanitarian frame for the legal debate, and the recent progress in efforts to eliminate them. So first, in the wake of World War II, countries continue to develop nuclear weapons and struggled with how to govern them. A small group of states developed and tested nuclear weapons in the South Pacific, Australia, Kazakhstan, Algeria, and elsewhere. During the 1954 Castle Bravo test, for example, which took place on Bikini Atoll in, in Marshall Islands, the US detonated a hydrogen bomb that was 1,000 times more powerful than that used in Hiroshima. At the same time, some steps were taken towards nuclear disarmament, but they were largely partial. The 1968 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, prohibited the spread of nuclear weapons, but did not strip uh, the nuclear armed states of their arsenals. Bilateral agreements reduced the number of nuclear arms, but did not eliminate or delegitimize the weapons. Other treaties created nuclear free zones, uh, but only in certain regions, or banned testing in certain places. The 1996 Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty addressed nuclear testing more completely, but 23 years after its adoption, it has yet to enter into force. Throughout the Cold War and its aftermath, national security concerns and arguments for deterrence as a means for preventing nuclear war dominated the discourse. And that brings me to the second historical period I want to highlight, which brought a major shift in international discussions of nuclear weapons. By the beginning of the 20th, 21st century, nuclear progress in nuclear disarmament had stalled. But in 2010, the International Committee of the Red Cross, UN agencies, and civil society began to reframe nuclear disarmament as a humanitarian rather than primarily a national security issue. The change was inspired by the growth of humanitarian disarmament, an approach to governing weapons that, was, um, that focuses on protecting civilians more than advancing national security interests. The approach had previously been used in international, to create international bans on anti-personnel landmines and cluster munitions. The shift was largely driven by the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, better known as ICANN. And um, it's a coalition of non-governmental organizations from more than 100 countries around the world. At a series of international conferences, ICANN and others highlighted the catastrophic consequences of contemporary potential consequence of potentially contemporary nuclear weapons. In addition, the living testimony of survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the so-called Hibakusha, as well as survivors of nuclear testing, added weight to the advocacy. The humanitarian perspective made nuclear weapons a matter of global concern, a threat to which we are all vulnerable. And it motivated non-nuclear armed states to take collective action. 
In 2016, the UN General Assembly voted to mandate negotiations of a new treaty banning nuclear weapons. So finally, the 2017 negotiations and adoption of the new treaty marked the beginning of the third period I want to highlight. Driven by the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of these weapons and pressure from ICANN and others, countries around the world produced a groundbreaking treaty. And the Human Rights Clinic here at Harvard participated actively in the process, providing legal advice to ICANN. On July 7, 2017, 122 countries adopted the treaty. Only one voted against it and one abstained. This treaty, which the miniature version is available here, but you can see the picture of the real, the real treaty upstairs in the exhibition, seeks to prevent future harm by absolutely banning all activities related to nuclear weapons. It addresses past uh, harm through positive obligations that require states to work together to assist victims of past use and testing and to remediate contaminated environments. It sets up a mechanism that allows nuclear armed states to join at a later date when they're prepared to give up their nuclear arsenals. And while the treaty is not the end of the process, the preamble makes clear that the ultimate goal is a nuclear free world. Nuclear armed states chose not to participate, but the, the treaty is the, also known as the TPNW, significant for several reasons. It makes nuclear weapons illegal as well as memorial and fills a legal gap that it existed in the government governance of weapons of mass destruction. Chemical and biological weapons have been banned, but not the, the worst weapons um, that have been produced. The treaty increases the stigma against nuclear weapons, building political pressure to address them. It acknowledges the suffering of survivors of both use and testing, and ensures that victims can receive assistance regardless of whether nuclear armed states have joined the treaty. And finally, it underscores the value of a humanitarian approach to nuclear disarmament which was also recognized when ICANN received the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. So at this point, I want to turn to our distinguished speaker, who will talk about her firsthand experiences with the atomic bomb and with nuclear disarmament. Setsuko Thurlow was a 13-year-old schoolgirl when the US, bomb, U.S. dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, and she survived the blast after digging herself out of the rubble. More recently, as a leading figure in ICANN, she has raised awareness of the horrific human consequences of nuclear weapons and advocated for their elimination. In 2017, she and ICANN's director, Beatrice Finn, accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the Global Coalition. So we're truly honored to have uh, Setsuko here today. And um, as I said, if, uh, if you could set aside your lunch, and I will turn it over to our main speaker. Thank you. You have no idea how delighted I am to be here. I really am. Now, I'll just speak from the heart. And of course, my experience as a victim on that day and aftermath, and since then, 74 years passed. So, talking about my own personal life, my family life, and collective memories of Hibaksha. We live together. I have lots I want to talk about, but because of the limitation of time, I just have to pick up a few things. Very So if anybody would like to discuss further, talk to me afterwards. I'll just pick up certain things which I think is basic. Well, I'll start with my own personal experience. Well, I have been speaking to people like you at the churches, high schools, labor unions, anywhere people show interest in nuclear weapon issue. I speak because I feel it is my responsibility as somebody who have intimate knowledge of what those horrific things can do to human beings. I consider it my moral responsibility. And it's the mission that I keep speaking about this uh, to as many people around the world. That's what I have been doing. Um, as mentioned, I was a 13-year-old girl a grade eight junior high school student, but Japan was losing badly in war 
Uh, we couldn't afford to stay in the classroom and study. We were mobilized by the army, by city government, and so on, to provide the cheap labor. Um, that very morning, I was at the military headquarters, not at the school. But three weeks prior to that, uh, about the group of 30 students were uh, recruited, and we started getting the training at the Army headquarters how to deal with the top secret uh, messages. So we learned how to decode those. Can you imagine 13 year old girls dealing with the nation's top secret information? How desperate Japan was. So I met the girl the group of 30 students at the station. We walked to the military headquarters and walked into the big wooden building. We went up to the second floor, and which was located about one mile from the ground zero. And at sharp at eight o'clock, the assembly started. And Major and I was giving us the pep talk. This is the day you prove your patriotism to the emperor, do your best, and so on. We said, yes, sir, we'll do our best. Then at that second, I saw the blinding bluish-white flash in the window. Then I had the sensation of floating up in the air. When I regained the consciousness, I found myself pinned under the collapsed building, total silence, total darkness. I tried to move my body, but I couldn't. So I knew I was faced with death. It was strange. I wasn't panic stricken in that condition. I calmly accept facing death. Then I started hearing faint voices of my classmates. Mother, help me. God, help me. So I knew I was not alone in that darkness. Then all of a sudden, somebody started shaking my left shoulder from behind. Strong male voice said, don't give up, don't give up. Keep moving, keep kicking, keep pushing. I'm trying to free you. You see the sun ray coming through that opening. Crawl toward it. Get out of here as quickly as possible. To make a long story short, that's what I did in the darkness. By the time I came out of the building, uh, building, no, there wasn't a building, the rubble, I should say, the rubble was on fire. I looked back and thought about my girlfriends in there in the same room. But no way I, I could go back into the flame. So that meant about 30 other girls who were with me in the same room were all burned to death alive. I looked around. Although it happened in the morning, it was dark, perhaps because of the smoke and soot and the particle in the air, which was rising in the mushroom cloud. So it took me some while before my eyes got adjusted. And then I began to see some moving dark object approaching to me. And finally I figured out they were injured people desperately shuffling from the center of the city to the outskirts. The man said, soldier said, well, you girls, I and two other girls, you girls joined that procession and escaped to the nearby hill. That's what we did. And we learned how to step over the dead bodies. And um, we managed to escape. At the foot of the hill, there was a huge military training ground about the size of two football fields. Quite a big place. By the time I got there, 
The place was packed with the dead bodies and dying people. Some grown, but mostly begging voices, very faint voices. Water, please. Water, please. Nobody was yelling, hey, I'm in trouble, give me water. Nobody had that kind of physical and psychological strength. Just simply begged for water. We wanted to be use, useful because we were lightly injured. We went to the nearby stream, washed off the blood and the dirt, and we tore off our blouses and soaked them in the water and dashed back and put that over the mouth of the dying people who just, <laughs> they just um, sucked in the moisture. That was a level of so-called rescue operation. I quickly looked around and see if there were help, any healthcare professional helping, but of course not. They too, uh, I learned later about 80% of the medical professionals, nurses were killed, they were too killed, but the remaining people were working at some other places, I think, but not where I was. So, uh, it, it looked rather hopeless kind of situation, but at least we were doing something people were asking for, and we kept, three of us kept doing that all day. When the darkness fell, we sat on the hill, and all night we watched the entire city burn, feeling numbed from massive death and human suffering we had witnessed all day. That is my first day. I can't, well, in my family, I lost nine members, my close family, uncle, aunts, cousins, sister, nephew, sister-in-law, and so on. Um, the, the injury was caused by the blast and the heat, heat of about three to 4,000 degrees Celsius at the ground level. I understand the, the explosion took place up there. In the center of that explosion, the heat was way over one million degrees Celsius, but that fireball descended to the ground where human beings are living, and they were simply incinerated. Some were vaporized, some were carbonized. Um, majority of the girls from my girls' high school were in the center part of the city. Together with the grade seven and grade eight students from all the high schools in the city. The city had a special project. They wanted to be prepared for the incendiary attack by the Americans. So to be prepared for that, they destroyed the buildings and to widen the streets. And uh, they called it the fire lane. They were building that. The cheap labor came from the students. So seven to 8,000 students, grade seven, eight students were brought to that point in the center part of the city. So majority of my schoolmates were there. I was at the army headquarters. That's why I think I, I am still alive today. Anyway, and those people had no chance to survive, most of them simply vaporized. But there was one girl, my best friend, who happened to be there, who survived and came back and told us what their last minutes were like. Everybody was so badly burned, and the math teacher was there supervising the girls and uh, they couldn't walk. 
the math teacher invited the girls to surround her. So from my school, all the girls came in circle. And last thing they wanted to do was to sing the hymn together. And their favorite, favorite word, um, what is the English translation for that? Nearer to thee, my Lord. That's what they chose. And together they sang, one by one. They passed away. So this girlfriend told us, the teacher said, those of you who can walk with me, let's walk to the nearby Red Cross Hospital. If you can't stand up, just hang on to my shoulder. So Miss Muramoto touched her shoulder. The flesh and skin just fell off. She could see her white bones. Anyway, she man they managed to walk to the nearby Red Cross. A couple of days later, the teacher died there. And my own sister-in-law, my eldest brother's wife, was also supervising the high school students there. We never found her body. Maybe she's one of those who simply vaporize. On paper, it says she's still missing. Um, my cousin was there too. Anyway, we rejoice when we learned that my favorite uncle and aunt survived. They were okay. No visible outside injury. But then about a week later, we started hearing, no, they were not okay. So after my sister and my nephew died, we had a so-called cremation for them. My parents went and looked after my uncle and aunt. And their description of the situation is that their whole body was covered with purple spots. And at that time, that was a sure sign they are going to die. And my mother said that their internal organs seemed to be rotten and uh, melting coming out a thick black liquid. My parents looked after them until their death. I'm just giving you a few examples of human suffering of 100,000 people. At that time, city had about 360,000 citizens. And they all went through this kind of situation. Um, well, that was a very day, and a few days after month. Well, I'll tell you that the next day I was reunited with my sister and her four-year-old child. They were badly burned. They were on their way to the hospital walking over the bridge. By the time I saw them, they couldn't see human figure in them. They were like ghosts. Um, after about three, four days, they died. The soldiers came, they dug up the ground, threw the body into that hole, poured the gasoline, threw the lighted match, and with a bamboo pole, they kept turning their body. Their stomach is half burned. Brain is not touched yet. Very crude remarks. And I, I was standing there. My parents were standing there too. 13 year old child just watching this so called unceremonious cremation, not feeling anything. I was just seeing something which was happening. And this memory troubled me for a long time. 
As I look back, what kind of human being am I? My very dear sister. And that was for the boy. I didn't even have tears. I didn't act like human being. What kind of human being am I? I kept asking myself. I guess I was blaming myself for not being normal Japanese, I mean human being. Well, years later, as I started university, started learning about psychology, started learning how human beings behave in the ultimate condition. And with additional input from American psychiatrist, Dr. Robert Lifton from Princeton, not Princeton, Yale, who came to Hiroshima and interviewed survivors and did some psychological study. And he said many interesting things. One of the things which help to understand this is that psychic numbing. In order to protect our psyche from enormous uh, stimuli coming from out there, uh, uh, the cessation of the emotional response takes place. And when I read that, oh, I kind of felt good. Maybe I wasn't so wicked and inhuman. And if this would to happen to many people, and I talked with many other surviving girls about their experiences, they too went home and entire family and exposed as a skeleton. They couldn't shed tears. So it wasn't not, not just my own experience. This was shared commonly by many, many people. So I was able to stop blaming myself. So I'm grateful to Dr. Lifton's study. Of course, some other thing he did write in that book, I disagree, and it's unfortunate. He overemphasized uh, survive, survivor's guilt. Somehow he painted the picture that survivors are all suffering from sense of guilt because we survived when somebody next to me died. Well, I never felt guilty for my life. I, re I am grateful for my life. So there are some differences of opinion. And thank goodness many survivors today are saying they are grateful they survived, rather than feeling I'm ashamed I'm alive. Anyway, I'm sorry if I got sidetracked, but then that's the psychological aspect of the survival. Now, of course, uh, um, the entire city became the nothing but the rubble. Um, okay. Um, no homes, they became homeless, and people were near starvation. Even before this happened, people were starving. Japan was finished. And there were no, the doctors were so confused. They didn't know how to handle the high fevers the people had. Maybe they thought this is scarlet fever. They had no idea what the radiation is, what radiation does to human bodies and so on. So they were very troubled. Just, they just did the best. Um, so homelessness and starvation, no medical attention. And uh, in this circumstance, central government did nothing to support us for first 12 years. It's hard to believe. You see, Jap Japanese government felt, well, they will never lose, and, and all of a sudden, they had to give, I mean, they had to surrender. I think they were in chaotic, <laughs> they were traumatized. They just couldn't think of the people suffering. They just dealt with their own chaotic condition. But city government tried to do some help. They negotiated with the armies. Armies had some supply left over, the cement and the lumber, some food and so on. So city was able to. And the neighboring community started sending some support personnel 
food and so on. But the, na- na- the people who came from outside to rescue us became sick because of the exposure to radiation. So our life was very chaotic at that time. I can't go, I, I can't describe anymore. But um, this significant thing is um, social discrimination started among the Japanese because the people who suffered from very bad cases of uh, burns, you know, layers and layers of uh, skin, and um, that made many people look very unsightly, to say the least. Some people called them, they look like ghosts. It was hard for anybody, especially for the girls, especially in the marriageable age. At that time, for a woman, marriage was a very, very important thing. Now, they couldn't be married with a ghost face like this. So those people just hid themselves in the home, couldn't be publicly seen. And um, the parents would say to their sons, uh, don't marry the woman who was in Hiroshima. And they burst deformed babies. Remember those babies with the tiny heads, microcephalus or something, and the, the brain didn't develop retardation as a result. So, um, there were a number. So, the discrimination about marriage and housing, employment. Oh yes, general condition was the people who were in the city at that time were generally very weak, very lethargic. They couldn't keep working all day. So the employment, nobody wanted to employ them. So there were all kinds of discrimination. But this, the, another big issue here is the psycho, social, and political um, factor. You see, Japan lost on the 15th of August, about a week after we experienced Hiroshima. And then Nagasaki followed three days later in the chaos. Then the entire nation surrendered. And occupation forces started arriving. And um, General MacArthur said, well, I came to Japan to demilitarize and secondly, to democratize. Well, we wanted to figure out what the democracy is all about. It was welcome. And one of the first thing, well, his idea was great, but as far as treating the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki was concerned, uh, General MacArthur did opposite thing. Some good things, like a status of women, you know, equal and social participation by the woman, our financial system had been included, and labor union was encouraged to develop some good things, of course, he introduced. But as far as Hiroshima Nagasaki was concerned, he did those things, which had detrimental effect. First of all, the atomic bomb casualty commissions were established in Hiroshima Nagasaki. People rejoice. Finally, we get some medicine. Finally, medical people can treat us. But soon, they were thrown to the depths of the disappointment. Because the sole purpose of this institution was to study the effect of radiation on human body period, not to support, help the suffering human beings. You can imagine how upsetting this was. They felt they were treated as a guinea pig, not just once, but twice. Then um, the censorship of the free press. Um, Of course, the newspaper wanted to 
write articles about the human suffering in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But the companies which published those things were forced to close, like Asahi, Japan's major paper, was ordered to stop publication. Because to describe human suffering caused by the bomb was not helpful to uh, American occupation forces. Instead, what a great scientific technological achievement the United States made by producing this powerful destructive weapon. That was okay to be written up and for the world to find out, but the human suffering inflicted upon by the mom was not to be written. So that was the censorship part, but that was not enough. They came up with, um, what's the English name? Confiscation. They started to confiscate people's diaries, correspondences, or some Japanese style poems, you know, haiku and tanka and things like that. Their hearts were filled with pain. They had to release them. So they wrote the poems and so on. Those things, photographs, family photographs, medical chart on information, anything which showed the human suffering was confiscated. 32,000 pieces, I think, uh, altogether were shipped back to the United States. I'm just giving you just a few of the things which happened in our lives in aftermath of the bombing. Um, I was told just a few minutes left, so yeah. Anyway, at the end of the seven-year occupation, so soldiers left, we became independent sovereign state again. Only at that time, the people started being exposed to the information that researchers, scholars, uh, journalists, for the first time, able to get information, medical information, legal information, um, political science. And so only when you have all this information and knowledge, they were able to see our place in the historical perspective and the global context. Only then we were able to locate ourselves, what significance our survival meant. So I would jump to the conclusion, okay? So only with that thought process, with the aid of incoming information, we felt this was the beginning of the nuclear age. This was the beginning of Cold War, we were used as an opening game of the chess between Soviet Union and United States. So we had the moral responsibility as someone who actually experienced, who understand intimately what horrid thing these are. And if this be allowed, this could be the end of the world, the end of humanity. So we decided to keep speaking out to the world, and that's what we have been doing the past 70 years or so. But two years ago, some exciting thing happened, and Bonnie was already talking about it. Finally, after seven decades of struggle, we have reached to this point. But this is only prohibition. We have to reach the elimination point when we get rid of all the nuclear weapons. That's the only time 
we can have security, safety, live in thing. So for our future generations, we have the responsibility to do everything we can to ensure there would be future for them. So I guess that's all I want to say. Did I keep my time okay? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll ask a question just to get us going. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, how did you, uh, what was your path from being a survivor to uh, being a nuclear disarmament advocate? How did you make that transition? Yeah, I heard. <laughs> <laughs> well, after that experience, almost the entire city became the pacifist city. After all, 15 years of war, Everybody was sick and tired. No more. We want peace, whatever peace is. And then the democracy was introduced. For the first time, we could look at ourselves as individual human beings. So at that time, we struggled to, just to understand what the human right is all about. It was simply just the words because we are so used to totalitarian way of being handled. Anyway, we became pacifists, I think. And um, in the Peace Park in Hiroshima, you must have visited that, and there is a Senate uh, inscription in that it said, rest, rest in peace, error will not be repeated. Some people said, there, it's missing the subject. Whose era is it? And some people wanted to think, point the finger at somebody who dropped it. And uh, so at that time, I remember, every day, every night on the newspaper, citizens were debating, arguing how we should live. And... Uh, to summarize that discussion, well, no point if we start arguing about who started it, this, that. There is no end. It's just whole system of violence, which is having our obsession. We got away from that. And from through that process, that wording came. So, we lucky survivors all made some kind of vow to our friends. I'm sorry, we miss you, but we'll use our life, whatever it takes. We promise, we make a vow, no other human beings going through what you went through. That was as a teenager and uh, other citizens to make that vow. Wow. So peace was very much in the mind. Well, in my case, this is my experience. In 1954, I finished, graduated from university there, <laughs> and I came to the United States on a scholarship. 1954 is a special year uh, for the calendar. That is the year United States tested the biggest hydrogen bomb in Marshall Islands, Bikini Atoll. So the whole entire Japan was up in a fury, not only Hiroshima, not only Nagasaki. Now people in Marshall Islands, they were showing the similar kind of symptoms and environmental damage and so forth. That was, so at that time, the, the anti-nuclear movement, the biggest social movement in Japanese history was born. And anyway, I came to the United States and the media pe person uh, interviewed me. You come from Hiroshima and in Japan they are making big fuss and we know what happened in the Pacific. What do you think? What's your opinion? Well, 
I was very naive, fresh out of college. I was not exactly prepared for United States. I just honestly told them, United States have to stop preparing for nuclear war. Enough is enough. No more suffering by human beings. You can't do this. And next day, that appeared in the local newspaper. And I started getting unsigned hate letter. This was the very first week after arriving in the United States. I couldn't go to the classroom. So the professor gave me his house, and I was left alone. And I had a week to do soul searching. And of course, there was temptation. Do I pretend? Do I act as though I know nothing about this? It was a traumatic experience, but to make a long story short, I came out of that week with a stronger resolve. No, if I don't speak, who else? It's my responsibility. So you see, in my life, as I look back, there are various points. As a teenager, growing up in that city, yes, I was together with everybody else. We made a vow to the dear people who were killed. But then that state doesn't always continue. It goes up and down. So when I came to the United States, bang, I had that experience that woke me up, yes. This is what I said that I would do. And I'm surrounded by the people who have the opposite view. They are all justifying what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's more difficult. Me alone, I don't have fellow survivors who support me, who can work with me. However, I still have to live my life. So that's how I have been living past so many years in North America. Often lonely, but not anymore. People like you, people like you, and I'm sure all of you would share my concern. And actually, I have a plea to make. You people are fortunate people. You have reached to this level of educational preparation. You are getting the best education. You have a lot to return to your society, to humanity, not just to the United States, to the entire world. And I am really asking you to take this issue seriously. It's really a matter of life and death. And each one of us have the responsibility to do our part. What can we do? Well, first we can learn, we get the facts, we build the knowledge, and then you don't have to be experts, but with certain bits of information and knowledge, you know what's morally acceptable or not. And once you know how you feel, do communicate your concern with the decision makers. Write to your politicians. Form the study group among yourselves. Read the books. There are lots of resource materials available in each neighborhood, in schools. There are a lot of people. Please, don't work alone. Work as a group and take action. I don't know what kind of response you get from the head of the White House right now, but still, don't give up. That's a proper institution. Do use it wisely. Thank you. That's my plea to you. I wanted to ask if you found over the years, can you hear me with your advocacy, that people were more receptive to the human suffering? Well. Initially, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I thought the churches and the various agencies, institutions wrote protest letters to Truman's action, and there was a lot more consideration to the human suffering. But then militarists and uh, 
the industrials took over the discussion of nuclear weapon. They just pushed the human voice out of that. So for a long time, you know, we felt we were abandoned, betrayed, well, betrayed by my own country because Japan is just um, totally subservient to your government. Yes, for many decades we have suffered from the sense of uh, not being supported by own your government. And the people, uh, yeah, majority of people here were busy justifying United States action and denying, justifying. It's difficult to talk to, but over the years, I think people became very knowledgeable. They started very active. In the past 10 years or so, with the introduction of this movement, humanitarian initiative, I was so delighted. The idea is, let's put the focus back on human beings, not on the weapon system and doctrine of deterrence and so forth. So actually, this is the happiest time for me as an activist living in North America. It's a good time for you people to join, join the forces. We have good thing going. Leadership like Bonnie and Kathy, Catherine. So I can, it's good group. It's amazing and lots of younger generation, not old timers. And the bright, energetic, very creative people came together from around the world. And I think they helped to achieve this first step. Thank you so much for your. Thank you. And um, on, that up, uh, on that very upbeat note, um, I just want to uh, thank you all for coming and thank Satsuka. But I also want to say that um, she's kindly brought uh, the Nobel Peace Prize with her, uh, better known as Alfred, for those of you who are in the know. So I encourage you all to come up and, and meet Alfred. And um, uh, if you want a picture taken or anything, feel free to come uh, ad admire this. It still gives me goosebumps to see it um, from having been part of this along with my colleague Anna Crow and many wonderful students. So thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate you coming today. Thank you.